So I'm going to do Revelation 20 today. I'm not sure how many verses we're going to get through, but um, I'm going to at least do the first part of it. Like I, um, maybe the first nine verses or so, because there's just a lot of scripture. So let's get started with prayer. Oh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day, and I thank you for this time. And I'm just grateful for all that you give us, Lord. I just want to thank you for, I just thank you for all that you are, and all that you always will be. And I thank you for your word. I'm thankful that it's a sword, and I'm grateful that it's a weapon, and I'm grateful that it's a peaceful weapon. So, Lord, I just <clears throat> offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving and just praise you and worship you and just thank you again just i'm in awe of you i love you and i adore you and i i just say all these things in your mighty and precious name lord yeshua hallelujah for your glory your honor and your praise and your thanksgivings hallelujah and amen so, um, in Revelation 20, um, I'm just going to go through, I wrote some, some of the, um, verses down, but I figured I might as well just go right to the text. Um, Revelation 20, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand <clears throat> he seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and satan other messages say who he who deceives the whole world and bound him for 1000 years he threw him into the abyss closed it and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years was completed, were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. And um, so I'm really, I guess I'll just go through verse 9 and then we'll just go from there. So this is starting back again at verse 4. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the people who had been beheaded, beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or the hands, their hands, they came to life and reigned with the Messiah for 1,000 years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until after the 1,000 years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over him, but they will perish but they will be, sorry, but they will be priests of God and of the Messiah, and they will reign with him for 1,000 years. When the 1,000 years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their numbers like the sand of the sea. They came up over the surface of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so I went a little bit further to 10, but... Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, it talks about this. In Isaiah, or not Isaiah, sorry, Psalm 140 as well. It's actually called a prayer for rescue. The um, verse 10 is the one that is... Um, most relevant, but I'm going to re read the whole thing. It's uh, Psalm 140, prayer for rescue. Rescue me, Lord, from evil men. Keep me safe from violent men who plan evil in their hearts. They stir up wars all day long. They make their tongues as sharp as snake's bites, as, as a snake's bite. Viper's venom is under their lips. 
Protect me, Lord, from the clutches of the wicked. Keep me safe from the violent men who plan to make me stumble. The proud hide a trap with ropes for me. They spread a net along the path and set snares for me. They say to the Lord, you are my God. Listen, Lord, to my cry for help. Lord God, my strong Savior, you shield my head on the day of battle. Lord, do not grant the desires of the wicked. Do not let them achieve their goals. Otherwise, they will become proud. When those who surround me rise up, may the trouble their lips cause overwhelm them. Let hot coals fall on them. Let them be thrown into the fire, into the abyss, never again to rise. Do not, slan do not let a slanderer stay in the land. Let evil relentlessly hunt down a violent man. I know that the Lord upholds the just cause of the poor, justice for the needy. Surely the righteous will praise your name. The upright will live in your presence. Just awesome. <laughs> um, but it's relevant because, you know, it's talking about, you know, the abyss. And an angel came down from heaven with a key to the abyss. And, you know, a great chain was in his hand is what it said um, in Revelations 20. And then <clears throat> another place where it mentions the abyss and the, the demons you know they didn't want to go um they said they would rather go to the pigs this is what they said in their um conversation with jesus it's luke 8 <clears throat> excuse me 31 I'm actually going to start at 30. What is your name? Jesus asked him. Legion, he said, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. And so a large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs, and he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank, the steep bank into the lake and drowned. And so... When, you know, the demons had departed from the man, you know, the people came out to see what was happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man the demons had departed from sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. You know, he was able to deliver him from the demons. You know, God is saying that we're going to, you know, we can do greater things and that we'll be able to cast out demons as well. Um, Romans 10. It's another mention of the abyss. And Romans 10, verse 7. I'll start at 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law. The one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will go down into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you in your mouth and in your heart. It says this is the message of the faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says it's everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, and then, um, for, you know, earlier in Revelations, because we're, you know, on Revelation 20, and Revelation 9, the next verse 1, says, The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. The key to the shaft of the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft of the abyss, and smoke came out from the shaft like smoke from a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. When locusts came out from the smoke on the earth, and power was given to them like the power that scorpions have on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not per permitted to kill, kill them, but were to torment them for five months. Their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. 
Um, in verse 11, you know, it talks about, you know, that, well, it, it starts in verse 7 about the appearance of locusts. It was like horses equipped for battle. And then in verse 11, it says they had as their king the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, his name is Apollyon. The first woe has passed. There are still more woes to come after this, it says. Um, and Abaddon means destruction, and Napoleon means destroyer. Um, this is also mentioned in Psalms as well. Psalm 107. And it's also, you know, another psalm for thanksgiving, for God's deliverance. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that he has redeemed them from the hand of the foe and has gathered them from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Some wandered in the desolate wilderness, finding no way to a city where they could live. They were hungry and thirsty. Their spirits failed within them. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He rescued them from their distress. He led them by the right path to go to a city where they could live. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wonderful works for all humanity. For he has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. Others sat in darkness and gloom, prisoners in cruel chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the counsel of the Most High. He broke their spears with hard labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He brought them out of the darkness and gloom and broke their chains apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wonderful works for all humanity. For he has broken down the bronze gates and cut through the iron bars. Fools suffered affliction because of their rebellious ways and their sins. They loathed all food and came near the gates of death, and they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He sent his word and healed them. He rescued them from the pit. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wonderful works for all humanity. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. I just said that. And announce his works with shouts of joy. Others went out, went to sea to shine or Oh, sorry. Others went to sea in ships, conducting trade on the vast waters. They saw the Lord's works, his wonderful works in the deep. He spoke and raised a tempest that stirred up the waves of the sea. Rising up to the skies, he went down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and all their skill was useless. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm into to a murmur, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet. Then he girded them to the harbor they longed for. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wonderful works for all humanity. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. He turns rivers into desert, springs of water into thirsty ground and fruitful land into salty wasteland because of the wickedness of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into a pool of water, dry land into springs of water. He causes the hungry to settle there and they establish a city where they can live. They sow fields and plant vineyards that yield a fruitful harvest. He blesses them and they multiply greatly. He does not let their livestock decrease when they are diminished and are humbled by cruel oppression and sorrow. He pours contempt on nobles and makes them wander in, trackless wasteland, in a trackless wasteland. But he lifts the needy out of their suffering and makes their families multiply like flocks. The upright see it and rejoice, and all injustice shuts its mouth. Let whoever is wise pay attention to these things and consider the Lord's acts of faithful love. Hallelujah and amen. Um, Psalm 149 also... Um, speaks on this as well. It talks about uh, praise for God's triumph. Hallelujah. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel celebrate its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing with, and make music to him. 
the tambourine and lyre, for Yahweh takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly celebrate in triumphant glory. Let them sh shout for joy on their beds. Let the exaltation of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands, inflicting vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, building their kings with chains and their dignitaries with iron shackles, carrying out the judgment decreed against them. This honor is for all his godly people. Hallelujah. Um, and let's see. Ezekiel 7, it even talks about forging the chain. Um, 23. This is Ezekiel 7, 23. Forge the chain, for the land is filled with crimes of bloodshed, and the city is filled with violence. So I will bring the most evil of nations to take possession of their houses. I will put an end to the pride of the. I will put an end to the pride. Pride of the strong and their sacred places will be profaned. Anguish is coming. They will seek shalom, but there will be none. Disaster after disaster will come, and there will be rumor after rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but instruction will perish from the priests and counsel from the elders. The king will mourn. The prince will be clothed in grief. In the hands of the people, the land will tremble. I will deal with them according to their own conduct, and I will judge them by their own standards. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. Um, and then it just goes on to talk about the visionary journey to Jerusalem, which is, you know, we're on our way to Zion, the holy city of Jerusalem. Hallelujah and amen. Um, and... We'll go back to the, you know, not the original scripture, but the, the original text that we had started with, Revelation 20, verses 2 and 3. I also saw the Holy One, or, or sorry, that's uh, the first, that's 21, forgive me says he seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and satan and bound him for 1000 years he threw him into the abyss closed it and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed after that he must be released for a short time um isaiah 24 also has the same thing um look the lord is stripping the earth bare and making it desolate he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants people and priests alike servant to master female servant to mistress buyer and seller lender and borrower creditor creditor and debtor the earth will be stripped completely bare and will be totally plundered for the lord has spoken this message the earth mourns and withers the world wastes away and withers. The exalted people of the earth waste away. The earth is polluted by its inhabitants, for they have, they have transgressed teachings, overstepped decrees, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse has consumed the earth, and its inhabitants have become guilty. The earth's inhabitants have been buried or burned, and only a few survive. The new wine mourns, the vine withers, all the carousers now groan. The joyful tambourines have ceased. The noise of the jubilant have stopped. The joyful lyre has ceased. They no longer sing and drink wine. Beer is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is shattered. Every house is closed to entry. In the streets they cry for wine. All joy grows dark. Earth's, rejoice, earth's rejoicing goes into exile. Only desolation remains in the city. Its gates has collapsed in ruins. For this is how it will be on earth among the nations, like a harvested olive tree, like a gleaning after a grape harvest. They raise their voices and sing out. They proclaim in the west the majesty of the Lord. Therefore, in the east, honor the Lord. In the islands of the west, honor the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth, we hear songs, the splendor of the righteous one. But I said, well, I waste away, I waste away. Woe is me, the treacherous act treacherously, the treacherous deal very treacherously. Panic, pit, and trap await you who dwell on the earth. Whoever flees at the sound of panic will fall into a pit. 
And whoever escapes from the pit will be caught in a trap, for the windows are open from heaven, and the foundation of the earth are shaken. And the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is completely devastated. The earth is split open. The earth is violently shaken. There staggers like a drunkard, drunkard and sways like a hut. See, and earth's rebellion weighs it down and it falls never to rise again. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven above and the kings of earth below. They will be gathered together like prisoners in a pit. They will be confined to a dungeon. After many days, they will be punished. The moon will be put to shame and the sun disgraced because the Lord of hosts will reign as king on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and he will display his glory in the presence of his elders. This is uh, Isaiah 25. Yahweh, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have accomplished wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. For you've turned the city into a pile of rocks, a fortified city into ruins. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will honor you. The cities of violent nations will fear you, for you have been a stronghold to the poor, for the poor, a stronghold for the needy person in his distress, a refuge from the rain, a shade from the heat, when the breath of the violent is like rain against a wall, like heat in a dry land. You subdue the uproar of barbarians as the shade of cloud, the cloud cools the heat of the day. So he silences the songs of the violent. The Lord of hosts will prepare a feast for all the peoples on this mountain. A feast of aged wine, choice meat, finely aged wine. On this mountain, he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth. For the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation, for the Lord's power will rest on this mountain. But Moab will be trampled in, its pl in his place as straw is trampled in a dung pile. He will spread out his arms in the middle of it as a swimmer spreads out his arms to swim. His pride will be brought low along with the trickery of his hands. The high-walled fortress will be brought down, thrown to the ground to the dust. This is, I'm just going to read one more, 20... Six. In that day, the song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation is established as walls and ramparts. Open the gates so a righteous nation can come in, one that remains faithful. You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. Trust in the Lord forever, because in Yah the Lord is an everlasting rock. For he has humbled those who live in lofty places and inaccessible city. He brings it down. He brings it down to the ground. He throws it to the dust. Feet trample it, the feet of the humble, the steps of the poor. The path of the righteous is level. You clear a straight path for the righteous. Yes, Yahweh, we wait for you in the path of your judgments. Our desire is in your is your, for your name and renown. I long for you in the night. Yes, my spirit within me diligently seeks you. For when your judgments are in the land, the inhabitants of the, the world will learn righteousness. But if the wicked man is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. In a, in a righteous land, he acts unjustly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. Lord, your hand is lifted up to take action, but they do not see it. They will see your seal for your people and they will be put to shame. The fire for your adversaries will consume them. Lord, you will establish shalom for us, for you have also done all our work for us. Yahweh, our God, lords other than you have ruled over us, but we remember your name alone. The dead do not live, the parted spirits do not rise up. Indeed, you have, you have visited and destroyed them. You have wiped out all memory of them. You have added to the nation, Lord, you have added to the nation. You are honored. You have expanded all the borders of the land. Lord, they went to you in their distress. They poured out whispered prayers because your discipline fell on them. The pregnant woman about to give birth rise and cries out in her pains. So were we before you, Lord. We became pregnant. We writhed in pain. We gave birth to wind. We have won no victories on earth, and the earth's inhabitants have not fallen. Your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For you will be covered in the morning with the morning dew, and the earth will bring out the departed spirits. 
Go, my people, enter your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the wrath is past. For look, the Lord is coming from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will reveal the blood shed on it and will no longer conceal her sin. Hallelujah and amen, I believe. And that's what we wait for is, you know, march towards Zion. Um, and so earlier in Revelations as well, it talks about seven things. Um, Revelations 7, 3. It says, don't harm. Well, this is at, this is at the beginning. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or in any tree. Then I saw another angel who had the seal of the living God rise up from the east. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were empowered to harm the earth and the sea. It says, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their foreheads. And I heard a number of those who were sealed. It was 144,000. Um, so, the nine... It says they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill them, but were to torment them for five months. Their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. And then... 13, starting out verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he sounded like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He also performs great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. He deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs he, that he is permitted to perform on the behalf of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the sword wound and yet lived. He was permitted to give a spirit to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he requires everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. The beast's name or the number of his name, here's wisdom. The one who has understanding must calculate the number of the beast, because it is the number of man, of a man. His number is 666. Um, in verses, Revelation, actually one more, 14 and 1. Then I looked, and there on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder. The sound I heard was like the harpist, also like harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but no one could learn the song except the 144,000 would be redeemed from the earth. These are the ones not defiled with women, for they have kept their virginity. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from the human race as the first fruits for God and the Lamb, and no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Um, back to Revelations 20, verses 4 and 5. It says, Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the people who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. Um, back in Daniel... Let's see, 
Alright, there's seven, chapter seven. And, um, you know, this is Daniel's vision of the four beasts. Um, Daniel, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream with visions in his mind. As he was lying in his bed, he wrote down the dream. And here is the summary of his account. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I was watching, and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. Four huge beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. It was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. Suddenly another beast appeared, a second one. It looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. While I was watching, another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings and a bird of a bird on its back. It had four heads and was given authority to rule. While I was watching in the night visions, a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong, with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and it trampled its feet with its feet wherever whatever was left. It was different from all the beasts before, and it had ten horns. While I was considering the horns, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up from among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. There were eyes in this horn like a man's, and it had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. As I kept watching, thrones were set in, up in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow and the hair of his head like whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire, its wheels like blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened and the books were open. I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking as I continued watching. The beast was killed as its body destroyed and was given over to burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their authority to rule was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions, and I saw one like a son of man coming with clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. And it gives, you know, an interpretation. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> of that vision and the rest of Daniel 7. Um, I'm going to move on in Matthew 19. <coughs> Excuse me. Get a little bit of um, Gospels in here, too. Um, Matthew 19 and verse 28 through 30. Jesus said to him, to them, I assure you, in the Messianic age, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, brothers or sisters, father or mother, children or fields, because of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first and the last first. And he goes into, in chapter 20, the parable of the vineyard, vineyard workers. Um, and let's see. In First Corinthians 6. Um, it says, if any of you has a legal dispute against another, do you dare go to court before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest cases? Don't you know that we will judge angels, not to mention ordinary matters? So if you have cases pertaining to this life, do you select those who have no standing in the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is not 
one wise person among you is able to arbitrate between his brothers? Instead, believer goes to court against believer and that bef and that before unbelievers. Therefore, to have a legal dispute against one another is already a moral failure for you. Why not rather put up with injustice? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you act unjustly and cheat, and you do this to believers. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this. That was me. I admit it. That was, I used to be like that. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be brought up under the control of anything. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will do away with both of them. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are part of Christ's body? So should I take part of Christ's body and make it part of of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says, the two will become one flesh, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual, sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Um, in Revelations chapter 3, starting at verse 14, it says, Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, because you say I'm rich, I become wealthy and need nothing. And, and you don't know that you are a wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, an ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and so opens the door, I will come into him and have dinner with him and he with me. The victor, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also won the victory and sat down with my father on his phone, throne. He already won the victory. Hallelujah. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And it says that anyone that has an ear. So if you're thinking, oh, well, that's just, you know, the church in Laodicea. Well, no. <laughs> it says everyone who has an ear should listen. Revelation 6, um, chapter, or verse 9, rather. Um, I know we already read this one, but when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar people slaughtered because of God's word and the testimony that they had. They cried out with a loud voice, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long until you judge and avenge our blood from those who live on earth? So a right, white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little while longer until the number would be completed to their fellow slaves and their brothers who were going to be killed just as they had been. Um, so, you know, get, I think, I don't think any of us escaped that and that's okay with me if that's the case. I don't know that for sure, but if that's the case, then it's a yes and amen for me. I'm not going to take the good and not accept the, the costs because Jesus paid the ultimate one that I couldn't. So, um, in first Timothy two and three, some of my 
favorite chapters of the Bible. It says, first of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. It says, this is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed to herald an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. It says, therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. And the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing with decency and good sense. Not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for the woman who affirm that they worship God. A woman should learn in silence with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over man. Instead, she is to be silent, for Adam was created first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. But she will be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and holiness, and with good judgment. Chapter 3 says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires, di desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an able teacher, not addicted to wine, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy, one who manages his own household competently, having his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert or he might be conceited and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders that it, so that he does not fall into disgrace in the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. And they may must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, too, must be worthy of respect, not slanders, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons must be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own households competently. For those who have served well as deacon, deacons acquire good standing for this, themselves and great boldness in the faith that is Christ Jesus. He says, I write these things to you hoping to come to you soon but if i should be delayed i have written to you or written so that you will know how people ought to act in god's household which is the church of the living god the pillar and foundation of the truth and most certainly the mystery of godliness is great it says he was manifested in the flesh vindicated in the spirit seen by angels preached among the nature nations believed on in the world taken up in glory and it goes on about um, demonic influence, which is exactly what we're, you know, talking about here. Um, let me see. Back in um, Luke 13. <laughs> Look at it. 13. 29 says they will come from east and west from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God note this some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last um, I'll drink water here and then you know I got um, scripture in revelations 2 8 and 13 4 as well but I'm going to go, let's go back to, you know, the original scripture, Revelation 20, and go to verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Um, that's verse 6 of Revelation 20. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of, and of the Messiah, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. That's in, you know, Revelation 1-3 as well. Um, it says, 
The one who reads this is blessed, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it are blessed because the time is near. Um, 14, 3. We just read 14.1. This is a little bit further down. It says, They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones not defiled with women, and you know they were redeemed as the first fruits, and no lies were found on their mouth. 16.15. Um, It says, look, I'm coming like a thief, the one who is alert and remains clothed so that he does not, may not go around naked and people see his shame is blessed. So they assembled them at the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. Um, 19, 9. This is Rev all Revelation, by the way. 19, verse 9. It says, then he said to me, write those invited to the marriage, marriage feast of the Lamb are fortunate. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow slave with you and your brothers who have the testimony about Jesus. That's why it's so important. You know, you got to have, you know, a reason for the re why you follow him. Worship God because the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, you know, when it talks about, I will pour out my spirit, this is what he's talking about. You know, it's the testimony, you know, about Jesus Christ, you know, and how he's a redeemer and a savior. And for me, he did. He, he, he technically, well, not technically, I haven't really been rescued out of anything. Like, like that I came here in, except for my perception joy and shalom which i did not have when i got here and so um yeah i just am grateful for that testimony it's gonna save me like and granted not because i did anything it's the testimony he gave me um 22 7 and 14 look i'm coming quickly the one who keeps the prophetic words of this book is blessed and in verse 14 it says, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexual immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. And Jesus says, you know, the the gate is narrow, or, you know, it's a narrow gate. It's it's a narrow road. It's, it's not going to be easy to get there, which... For me personally, and I know I've said this, but I'm going to keep harping on it, is that I wouldn't want it any other way. Because if it had come to me easy, I don't think I would have this devotion. I don't know. I just don't think I would. God could give it to me still, but I just, <laughs> I don't know. He would, again, he would have to give it to me. Um, it says, to him who loved us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to his God and father, the glory and dominion are his forever. You know, um, Jesus does say that. I believe it's in, I want to say it's in Corinthians that he says that we're a royal priesthood, a chosen race. Um, Revelations 5, 10 says, uh, you made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Um, you know, back at, you know, back in Revelation 2, uh, verse 11 says, Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor will never be harmed by the second death. And Jude also talks about the second death. So, you know what, let's just go there since I thought of it. I, I guess I, I should just follow what the Spirit says and go ahead and go to Jude. Um, go ahead and read that says Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James to those who are called, loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. So that's everybody. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Dear friends, although I was eager to write 
to you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write and exhort you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once and for all, once for all. For some men who were des designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into promiscuity and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. And I want to remind you, though, that, that although you know all these things, the Lord first saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. And he is kept with eternal chains and darkness for the judgment of the great day. The angels who did not keep their own position but deserted their proper dwelling in the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them committed sexual immorality and practiced perversions, just as the angels did, and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Nevertheless, these dreamers likewise defile their flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme glorious ones. Yet Michael, the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil in the debate about Moses, Moses' body, rather, he did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they don't understand. But they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, they destroy themselves with these things. Woe to them, for they have traveled in the way of Cain, have abandoned themselves to the error Balaam for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion. These are the ones who are like dangerous reefs at your love feast. They feast with you, nurturing only themselves without fear. They are waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead, pulled out by the roots. Wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. And Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied about them. He says, look, the Lord comes with thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict them of all their ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. These people are discontented grumblers walking according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time there will be scoffers walking according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are unbelievers, not having the Spirit. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. You've got to expect it. It's, it's pursuing you. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Hallelujah and amen. Um, in uh, Revelations 27 and 8, it says, When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and, and will go um, out to deceive the nations. Um, Genesis 3, 13, Eve was the first one to be see, deceived. You know, Paul even, re, 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 ah, Paul even warns us of this in 2 Corinthians um Let's see, what is it? Second Corinthians eleven. Second Corinthians eleven three. And it says, um, But I fear that as a serp as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning cunning, your minds may be seduced from a complete and pure devotion to Christ. For a person if a person comes and preaches another Jesus who you did not preach, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you had not accepted, you put up with it splendidly. Um, again, in uh, 1 Timothy, he talks about it again. Um, 2 in um, 1 Timothy 2, 14, says, 
And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed, but she will be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and holiness and good judgment. Second John 7 says this. It says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves. So you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. It says anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching, but goes beyond it, does not have God. The only one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and don't say welcome to him. For the one who says welcome to him shares in his evil works. Um, and I guess since it's, let's see, Revelation... Twelve nine it says, um, well, this is I'm gonna go ahead and start at seven. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah has now come because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown out. The one who accuses them before God day and night, they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives in the face of death. Hallelujah and amen. Let that be me too, Lord. Um, 18, 23. And that says, um, The light of the lamp will never shine in you again, and the voice of a groom and bride will never be heard in you again. All this will happen because your merchants were the nobility of the earth. Because all the nations were deceived by your sor sorcery, the merchants, you know, um, and I guess maybe the people not relying on God, 1920 says, but the beast was taken prisoner and along with him, the false prophet who had performed the signs in his presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshiped, worshiped his image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider and the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Um, in verse, you know, 8 of um, 20, you know, let's see, let's, I'm going to just go through the text. It says, um, and, we'll, you know, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. The number is like the sand of the sea. I know we read that already, but Isaiah 11, 12, and I only have a couple more scriptures left, and so we're just going to go ahead and finish them out. Isaiah 11, verse 12, it says, uh, let's see, what does it say? It says, he will lift up a banner for the nations and gather the dispersed of Israel, he would collect the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Um, and Ezekiel 7, 2 also talks about the four corners. And let's, let, let's see, what is it? 7, 2. It says, Son of man, this is what the Lord God says to the land of Israel. An end, the end has come on the four corners of the land. It says, the end is now upon you. I will send my anger against you and judge you according to your ways, and I will punish you for all your detestable acts. I will not look on you with pity or spare you, but I will punish you for your ways and for your detestable practices within you. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. And so I just want to, um, I guess, end with that. Or I guess I do have some more, but I'm still going to go ahead and end with that since it's about an hour. And I just uh, thank Father God for this time again, and I just thank you. Um, God for each and every single one of you and I just love you and I God bless you. Have a good day. God bless you.